This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. So, well, so, so maybe I'll, I'll start with just uh, defining what we talk about because we will talk, uh, use a lot of the concept of the commons and I'm sure other speakers have done that, but I just want to define it in my own way because there's multiple visions. And so it's quite simply three things. So it's a shared resource. Uh, so it's an object that has to be something that is made together, which can be immaterial material. And uh, there is the activity of people, the choice of people to do this. So there's no commons without commoning. So that's the commoning part, the activity part, which means that there's nothing out there that is a commons. It's something that we make into a commons. And finally, very importantly, the um, the capacity to make your own rules and norms. So the, uh, the self-governance uh, of, of these activities. So these three things for me are what make a commons. And historically, uh, we've had uh, first uh, kind of a generalization and dominance of natural resource commons, which have been discussed by uh, Ostrom. We've had after capitalism, which has largely destroyed um, these common resources, we have uh, the social commons in my view. So that means that when farmers are obliged to leave their common land. They arrive in the cities, they die when they're 32 in, in the 1850s. They build social commons. So I consider, you know, mutualities, uh, fraternal societies, all these things that the labor movement built to mutualize life risk as, as a kind of a commons. Finally, knowledge commons, uh, everything we've known since the emergence of the internet. So the capacity of people to permissionlessly, permissionlessly create these vast knowledge resources that they share with each other, like Wikipedia, Linux, but also designs nowadays, Arduino. Uh, and finally, um, very importantly, um, this is based on a study I did uh, two years ago in Ghent. So the emergence of urban commons on, on quite a significant scale. Uh, so we have seen a tenfold increase of these urban commons. Um, in uh, let's say I'll, I'll use the example of Ghent from 2006, 50 to 500 in 2016. So most provisioning systems, mobility, habitat, food, today are also available in common centric forms. Um, most of these urban commons are redistribution uh, projects. So you're not making the cars, but you create a nonprofit uh, to use the cars in a different way. There's two exceptions. There's food, so like a community-supported agricultural system. Even if the land can be the property of the individual farmer, the ecosystem is a commons. It's co-managed, co-governed by the uh, stakeholders. Uh, there's no war between producers and, cons and consumers. And uh, therefore, um uh, you actually have a next step there they're already productive commons and similarly with when you do renewable energy so that's kind of the picture today and the first question uh i want to address here is okay all this emerges within a dominant capitalist system uh a lot of people want to do uh, commoning and are starting uh, again to do a lot of commoning but how do you make a living uh, in a system which is not common centric and which has historically uh, been against the commons? Now, I want to point out to a, an important change, which is that, um, and I know it sounds weird, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, we are moving from a Marxist capitalism to a Proudhonian capitalism. What I mean by that is that historically, the uh, it was thought that you know the surplus uh, for our system comes from from the workers and natural resources, um, 
And in the 19th century, Proudhon was arguing that no, no, actually the surplus comes from putting people together. So human cooperation creates the surplus. You have 100 craft workers. If you put them together in a factory, they'll be more uh, productive. And so this shift is today, if you look at the new companies like Google and Facebook for immaterial production, they don't really produce, we are producing the documents that Google helps us find. Uh, we are communicating on Facebook and then Facebook commercializes our attention. Uh, Uber and BNB, they don't make cars nor uh, buildings and apartments, um, but they let us exchange in a peer-to-peer -peer way uh, and they capture value. So why is this important? Because there's a shift from a capital labor contradiction, which still exists, it's still out there, it's very much dominant, but there's also a shift to something else, which is the extractive relationship between commons and market forms, uh, particularly capitalist market forms. Um, so I want to speak a little bit about this particular relation. You're a commoner, you want to create a common resource with your community. Um, you don't want to be always depending on philanthropy. Um, you, you want to make a living from this. You want this to be a part of your life. You want This is how you want to get your food and your housing and your mobility. Um, and how do, you, how do you survive? How can you, can you look at this? So, so this is really about commons market relationships, right? And the shift that we would like to see as commoners from uh, being in an extractive relationship with the market, so the market captures the value of our cooperation to a situation where we have our own companies, our own cooperatives, our own solidarity economy around the shared resources. And so we create a generative a relationship between uh, the market and the commons. So how can we do this? Very generically, some concepts I think might be useful. And the first one, uh, and so I want to say that this is based on observation of peer production communities. We've done several studies like P2P value, an EU funded study, we studied 300 um, actual peer production communities. And in Ghent, I, I studied the actual urban commons um, and specifically 80 of the 500. So here is what people are trying to do. And the first concept is value sovereignty. So you might have heard of food sovereignty, technological sovereignty. So it's the idea that you can be more autonomous uh, from the surrounding society and the pressures and the mandates of that surrounding society. Just a moment. Um, so, value sovereignty means that you are going, as a community, you are going to determine yourself what is value for you. Because the market is a value dictatorship. It says, if it's labor as a commodity, you sell your labor that has value. If you volunteer to clean up the beach or you do domestic work, it has no value. Uh, so this is a very important thing. So what the first thing you want to do as a peer-to-peer -peer community is decide amongst yourselves what is value for you. And peer-to-peer -peer systems are contributory systems. They are today they're open contributory systems. So we are no longer in an era where the only option is to create closed organizations, where I have to hire you first in order for you to do commoning. We have open platforms that allow people uh, to join and to contribute. So the first thing you want to do is recognize those contributions. And so one of the solutions to organize this value sovereignty is to create a membrane between the market and the, the commons and the market. And within that membrane, within the commons, within the contributory sphere, you decide to recognize certain contributions and to say, if we make a living, if we generate income, then this contribution will be rewarded and this is our common rule 
of how we organize this and we set up uh, open and contributory uh, accounting system uh, if people are interested you can look at sensorica which is a canadian uh, community where uh, this is being done uh, i have a section on the wiki of the p2p foundation with several hundred examples so this is something that's quite real uh, a lot of people are practicing for example contributory rent in a common building deciding that people who do more for the common good will pay less rent than people who are directly there for commercial reasons so that's that's an example of contributory accounting applied to uh, to rent paying um so this is uh very important so uh, value sovereignty then uh, another step would be what do you do with capital as you move from free software open designs to actually physical things you need to pay people you need buildings you need raw materials so how do you get that capital and here's an interesting concept i think that um, our listeners and viewers might want to know about this is called um, transvestment transvestment being the link the, the way in which a commons community can accept capital from the outside without that capital uh, cre uh, having sovereignty over your project so typically when you go to venture capital um, if they invest in you they will ask things like okay we want equity in your startup this gives them power we want you to sign an NDA uh, agreement. This uh, doesn't allow for the sharing of the knowledge. We want you to sign a 10 year contract that says that you cannot, if you fail, uh, continue in the same sector. So all these rules that, that signify power of capital over your own projects. Uh, so one of the things you can do is to split, to make a wall between the capital and the uh, generative entity your livelihood entity so this can be all kinds of things but uh, you know think about for purpose entities uh, and you you have a for purpose management or governance um, you are obliged to use capital sometimes uh, and to pay it back so you can have capped returns for example so you limit the returns to capital you give it the time limit uh, so this is something that was practiced by and spiral a uh, generative coalition of entrepreneurs uh, in New Zealand, but they're working quite beyond New Zealand now, uh, in order to fund Lumio, the open source decision-making system that's now spreading uh, in many uh, of these communities. So this is the, uh, so we saw value sovereignty, we saw transvestment. Um, I would say one more thing, uh, which is the idea of copy fair. And how do you relate the commons to the market? Again, what kind of relationship do you establish within the commons community and surrounding entrepreneurial entities? Um, by the way, I use the word entrepreneurial, uh, which I think uh, fits better because entrepreneurial, the etymology is taking in between, entrepreneurial would mean giving in between, I mean, generative livelihood organizations, which strengthen the commons and the commoners instead of extracting uh, too much value from it um yes yeah, so the the copy fair principle is the following we have copy left which says everybody can use this resource but if you change something to it like in free software the, all your improvements have to be put back in a common pool but notice the everybody. Everybody means a big multinational can do this. This is seen less as a problem in free software because the capital requirements are very low. But once you have to invest in machines, in raw materials, certain actors like in the solidarity economy, the social economy, the cooperative economy are very wary of having big multinationals you know, taking these designs and then using them with all their capital to compete on the market. And so you have all these commoners co-designing, uh, but then it's captured by uh, large companies. And so 
instead of copyright, which says it's from us only, copy fair says, yes, you can share, meaning you can share the knowledge, but if you want to commercialize, you have to, to exhibit a reciprocal relationship with the commons and the shared resource. Can be done in many different ways. Uh, one would be, um, uh, for example, a membership fee in, in a coalition which maintains an infrastructure. And so I want to conclude, because I, I kind of forgot to say that in the beginning, that the common structure that we see in the commons economy of today, this is true for both knowledge common, like free software economies, open source economies, and it's also true for uh, urban commons that we studied, and, and it's likely to be true for the productive commons that are emerging which is that you actually have three players today. So it's a triarchical system. It's not a binary system, market and state. It's a triarchical system, commons, market and state. Um, so you have at the core of value creation, a contributive community that has its own rules, its own governance. Open source has a maintainer system where you have uh particularly expert people who are going to protect the integrity of the ecosystem by saying no or yes to certain contributions to certain um, you know software patches for example so they're not a command hierarchy they're a control hierarchy they protect the ecosystem and you see that in many many different projects uh, you know the majority that i've seen practice this because you need to protect quality uh, in an open contributory system then you have the entrepreneurial coalition. That's the second factor. And then you have four benefit associations. And this would be that the commoners and the entrepreneurs get together to create a NGO, a foundation, an association that will maintain the infrastructure of cooperation over time. Um, think about the Linux Foundation, think about Drupal Association, these kinds of uh, organizations. And maybe you can see that uh, from this kind of observation of these germ forms, of these seed forms, that are developing a post-capitalist relation between the commons and the market, uh, and are creating governance institutions, that this starts also, and at least that's what I do, it could be seen as the form of a new society, uh, from a society that has market state binary, in which the market doesn't recognize externalities, positive and social, positive and negative social environment externalities. It doesn't pay its own costs. Uh, and it doesn't pay for free labor and, and contributions. Um, so and and so moving to a more post capitalist logic in which we say the value is created around the shared resource through contribution so it's not a labor system based on salaries it's a contributory system we have added value created for the market uh in the entrepreneurial coalition the entrepreneurial coalition around the commons so that's the market system it has a generative relationship and then we have these associations so civil society becomes productive and we recognize that for example this is the whole, one of the ideas to justify a basic income but whether it's possible or not the idea is that citizens contribute to the common good to shared resources and we could have a global contributory accounting system which is something that's now attempted by the common good economy movement in europe where they have this common good balance with 17 indicators describing various aspects of engagement with the common good and production for the common good. Um, then we have the sphere of the state and the state becomes a partner state, a facilitating state, an enabling state, a state that ensures contributory equality between all citizens. Uh, so civil society, productive, the ethical economy, generative, and then the state uh, enabling, facilitating. So this is a vision, I think, um, uh, of uh, a society, a societal form 
that would that is emerging within the dominant system and uh, this brings me to the second topic so we looked at um, uh, commons market relationships are so to briefly um, explain uh, how we could look at public commons relationships common state common city relationships and this is based on the work i've done in ghent so we mapped uh, the commons in the city the urban commons uh, we talked to 80 different founders of these projects and we asked them you know how do you see this how what do you expect from the city and we produced a report the commons transition plan for uh, the city of ghent so um, what we should look at is not public-private partnerships here in this context, but public commons partnerships, public commons cooperation. Eventually, we could also look at the idea of the commonification of public services. Uh, so can we see, uh, let's take in the UK, national, you know, Corbyn wants to nationalize rail because 80% of English people and British people want this. Uh, privatization was pretty much a disaster. So if, if do you want just a state bureaucracy, do it? No, you could say, let's make this into a multi-governance, poly-governed, uh, common good entity, where users, workers, uh, uh, and the, the government that finances the system all have a say and so in this, this sense, you, you make a public services into a commons-oriented, commons-centric public service, right? Commonification of public services. So this is a general kind of view you could have if you look at the public commons relationship. Uh, here's what we propose uh, to the people of Ghent based on their own input and based on looking at what happened in other countries like Italy. So the first concept would be a commons accord. A commons accord is based on a regulation which allows citizens to say, we want to care for this resource. This should be a shared resource. And you contract with the city, the rules and obligations that are going to govern your taking care of this common resource. So the the pioneering example of this, and they should have chosen a shorter name, uh, is the Bologna Regulation for the Care and Regeneration of the Urban Commons, which is now practiced in 100, more than 140 Italian cities and is also used in a different way uh, in the Netherlands. It's called the Right to Challenge there. It has a more neoliberal uh, swing, if you like. Uh, but this is also what we discussed in Kent. Um, the uh, important notion uh, is to see the city as a convener. So once you have a commons accord, it doesn't mean that the city controls everything. It means that the city starts acting as a convener, facilitator and enabler of that commons by creating a support coalition. And here the model that's used in, in Italy, just to give an example, is called the quintuple helix governance model that was developed by uh, Labgov and Christian Iaione and Sheila Foster um, in their studies of these Italian cities, um, so uh, Copalermo, Copologna, etc. Um, the quintuple helix is, says that the city, the Chamber of Commerce, the research organizations like universities and the formal civil society organizations like NGOs all band together to, to create a support mechanism for a particular commons project. It's very contextual to the project. What does a particular project need to succeed? And can the city help in the context of that accord to, to make it more easy and possible to actually do this uh, in a good way? Um, so commons accord, uh, the city as convener. I would also like to introduce the notion of contributory democracy which um, is a notion of um, how to integrate this multitude of projects into the governance of the city itself. Um, representative democracy is you vote for me and therefore now it's 
for the representative body to decide. So it gives you a mandate. Participative democracy would be, let's ask the people. Often, you know, organized top down. But the commons, the commoners bring something new uh, uh, in this, which is, and I want to give uh, you the example from Ghent. So Ghent has a, you know, uh, red, green, blue coalition, social democrats, the greens, the social liberals. And they have, uh, you know, went to the citizens with, uh, with the, and they got a mandate for climate change adaptation. So they created this food council. Food council wants to be representative in the sense that it gets all these big organizations from farmers and, and but these are established systems with legacy uh, interests. Um, and they're not going to be the ones that are pushing the most for the change, on the contrary. On the other hand, you see that citizens are actually doing it. So you have, let's say, Degage, which is a uh, non-profit uh, car sharing uh, project, 130 cars, 1,300 uh, members, users. And according to studies, they bring down the number of cars needed by these 1300 people by a factor of 9 to 13. So every shared car uh, replaces 9 to 13 private cars that would have existed if they would if they wanted the same level of mobility with private ownership. So this is a huge contribution to climate change, to diminishing the human footprint, um, you know, the thermodynamic footprint of the material and energy needed for this function. And this is what these urban commons are doing. They're massively breaking down uh, the level of material resources needed while at the same time keeping uh, a very high level of service, right? Because this is basically what our world is facing. Uh, we're facing a climate change, resource crunches, uh, all these dangers are coming to us. Well, we can't just go back and, and escape because we have nuclear energy and we have to keep a complex society just to maintain these things from harming the planet. So we're kind of stuck in this idea that we need to uh, maintain as much as we can a complex society. And this is what the Commons offers today uh, in urban and later in a, in a bigger translocal, transnational uh, setting. It, it, dramatically brings down the human footprint. And so this gives a logic of contribution that should be recognized by the institutions of the city. So that's what they did in Ghent. They have a working group for the food transitioners that's actually integrated in the food council because they carry out the mandate that the people gave to the ruling coalition. So I think this is an interesting concept that allows the city to cooperate institutionally uh, with the commons group that are you know, carrying out these things. So I have five minutes left, if I'm correct. Hi, yeah, I was uh, just about to yeah. give you a five minute reminder. So if uh, you don't mind making any concluding statements. Yes, so what I want to do here is kind of give you a taste of what I'm working on with the P2P Foundation. So we have you know, 10 people in our uh, research lab nowadays. And uh, this summer, uh, I worked with a colleague on, uh, you know, what kind of global infrastructure would we need to make this shift? So this is moving actually from the urban to the translocal, transnational. And note, I'm not saying international. So I'm not talking about collaboration between states, nation states. I'm talking about collaboration globally, cosmolocally in which knowledge is shared globally, uh, which means collective infrastructures for everyone. Um, so think about this. And this is half science fiction. What I mean is that these things exist in seed form, people are working on it. I'm presenting a vision of how the world could be, how production could be, if it all came together very quickly because time is limited. So we need open and shared supply chains, right? We, we need to move to actual production in a common centric way. The mediation between physical production 
which is entirely, almost entirely capitalistic today. And the knowledge commons, uh, which we already use for immaterial production, we can do free software together globally without a hierarchy. This is producing the Linux. What we need is a mediating knowledge, a new layer, and that layer is accounting, distributed ledgers. Uh, so we need the supply chains to be connected with an internet of verification uh, that verifies all the transactions happening in the productive sphere, in the sphere of actual material production. Um, so imagine a shared circular supply chain with the entrepreneurial coalitions cooperating and sharing their logistical information, verified with distributed ledgers, with shared accounting. And there are three forms of accounting being developed, which are useful for this very quickly. Open and contributive accounting, which we discussed already. Second, REA accounting, flow accounting, resources, uh, events, actions. This is not double entry book accounting, which sees the world as accumulation of my assets, my corporate assets. This is flow accounting, showing us what's happening in the network. And then we have biocapacity accounting, which is the capacity to, direct, to directly look at energy and material flows. Um, so this is why people get so excited about the blockchain, but the blockchain uh, has uh, many uh, faults in its design. It's uh, you know, very much in influenced by anarcho-capitalist, proprietarian designs, so, which basically says we can't trust people, we can't make collective decisions. Uh, so many of these contracts that are verified and maintained by, uh, you know, this kind of machinic system, uh, the algorithms. Uh, therefore, every transaction needs to be verified with all transactions that are, have already taken place, which creates, you know, um, uh, exponential need of resources to maintain this infrastructure. This is crazy. Uh, I know they're working on it, but I think the, a better step yet is to look at Post blockchain disputed ledgers like Holochain, which do it. So imagine, so you're a commoner, you're contributing to a project. You know, if you have the skills, you can join many, many different projects. You have a live project, you select your your work. You're a member of a labor mutual which manages your life risk, a distributed income cooperative. Uh, and this is seen in the uh, contributive accounting plugin. You work with people and you can see how to coordinate your work through the REA uh, accounting uh, mechanism. And you know what is your context-based sustainability, what you can use as an individual uh, cooperative uh, bioregion in terms of you know, the material and energy flows. Uh, this to me would be a system where we would actually see the externalities where we can work for human needs and staying within planetary boundaries. There's so much more to say. Uh, I wanted to talk about you know, uh, regenerative uh, circle of finance. I don't have the time, uh, but that might be for uh, another occasion. Uh, so you know, how we can actually structurally fund regenerative work instead of extractive work. Right. Thank you so much, Michael. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to open the panel up for um, any questions that the attendees might have. Yes. Um, I need to take a sip of water. Of course, so of course. The, my computer is going to move because I'm uh, <laughs> using my laptop. Just a moment. I should have done this before, but I, I think it's fine. Yes. If I don't, if no one has a question, I have a few questions for you, but I'll give it another thirty seconds. It looks like we don't have any questions for now, but I have a, I have a question based on some, some, something you said. You talked a lot about this movement away from um, a previously established Marxist-based system, and you talked about the relationships between you know, commons and a capitalistic system. So my question is, 
is the environment that you live in conducive to this sort of autonomous lifestyle? Like does living in an urbanized area, urbanized environment promote, promote a healthier commons approach or like an overall, um, bit like a better standard of living? Well, uh, I think it could be the opposite, actually. And I, I just want to say when I say, you know, Marxist, uh, I was you know, being ironic in the sense that, you know, surplus value comes from exploitation, right? It right. comes from extracting value from workers and natural resources, as opposed to this other vision, which is the, the surplus value comes from a corporate, right? And so you have these companies now that don't produce anymore. They let us work for them. They don't pay us a salary. Right and they extract value from us. That was the point I was trying to make. Um, but I would say um, that there is kind of a reverse relationship between the, the commons uh, and the capital system. Uh, and even more in general, um, you know, there's, a, there's this study called Handy, Human and Nature Dynamics, uh, which looks at societies uh, according to a predator-prey model. And you know, if the if the ruling class, as it were, extracts too much, it's gonna harm. Uh, so the tigers are going to harm the gazelle population, which is going to collapse, and then the tigers collapse with it. And so every civilization has collapsed because it's competing with neighbors. And in order to win the competition, they have always, always, otherwise they would still exist, overused their resource base. And what you see historically is the commons always come back at these moments where the structural crisis of civilizations, where they have been, uh, they've been overshooting and, and they're starting to disintegrate and lose now. And then Looks like we've- um... As we actually also see Sorry. We see Sorry. a similar cycle, yeah, which is, you know, in the, so this is called the conurative cycle. So there are like 30 years of high growth, 30 years of low growth, and then structural crisis, you know, 1873, 1929, 2008, and then you have a new cycle coming up. The, the, the commons and the mutualization come at the moments of difficulty. It's when people see market and state failure that they are saying, you know, we need to do these, these things by ourselves because we can't wait, you know. And so right now it's, it's happening a lot in Western countries because if you're young today, you're a young urban uh, person, um, you know, unemployment rates are very high for young people in Europe. They, you know, 30% in France, 50% in Greece, um, so this is not just idealism. Some people do it mm -hmm. out of idea. You know, usually right. the founders have some idea, but the reason they get traction is because people actually need to do it. So it's conducive in that sense. Right. You know, if you, if you don't see, a, a, if you can't tell yourself a story that my life is going to be better by competing in the capitalist system, if you, and that story is still quite convincing, let's say for the Asian middle class, Right, uh, but it's not very convincing uh, for young people in the West, where the, the social contract has become negative. Like, you know, I'll have less chance to buy a house than my parents. Uh, I'll probably earn less than my parents. Right, so the it's not a very promising future, uh, right. and it's a we can see the structural crisis. That's when you have this shift of a lot of people, more and more people saying, "Is there another way?" And that's when the commons strive as a kind of answer to this uh, structural crisis. Perfect. Because, you know, just to give you an example to make it concrete, right? So if you join this car sharing co-op, which I mentioned, right. um, you maintain access to mobility. You use a lot less resources. So it's gonna be a lot cheaper for you. It's gonna, be, it's gonna cost you 20% of what it costs you to have a private car, right? Um, so you have ecological benefits, you have financial benefits, you have social benefits. Uh, and this combination makes it attractive in those particular periods where the story of, you know, I can get out of the rat race on my own uh, mm -hmm. becomes difficult to maintain. Fantastic. Thank you.
Um, I'm just going to look at the question answer box to see if anyone's got any more questions. So it doesn't seem that way. So I think with this, I'd like to like to conclude the seminar, uh, the session. Again, on behalf of the IASC and all the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to thank all the attendees and of course, Michael Bowens for preparing and giving this fantastic webinar talk. Um, in closing, we'd like to remind all the attendees of two IASC events that, that are upcoming in the, in the near future. These are also advertised on the World Commons Week website. Um, uh, Dylan, maybe one thing, um, because you know my presentation was very dense. Uh, okay. I realized that a lot of things to to uh, share in a short time. Of course. So we have we have a wiki wiki dot p two p foundation dot net, and also okay. transition dot org. Those are two the, the two websites where people can find out the documentation, which justifies what I'm what I'm talking about. Perfect. So, yeah, um, you know, yeah, so it's well documented. What everything I'm saying are actually existing, concrete experiences by people. Fantastic. Which um, been if you if you can, uh, could you send either me or Charlie an email, and I'm sure we can put that up on sure. the website because it's right. not easy for people Good. to access it that way. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. Again, on behalf of the IAS and the World Commons Week organizing team, thank you so much for attending. Thanks, Dylan. For the, have for a lovely day. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank you for making thank this possible. Definitely. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, Michael. Bye. Bye-bye.